My favorite part of the story is when you're down there at 425, if you've got sweat still in your armpits from like, oh, she wasn't going to stamp it. The elevator doors opened and the attorney from the floor above walked out. He's legitimately the most respected lawyer in town. I knew that if the paper wasn't stamped by 430, he's that type of lawyer, right? If it's not done to the T, he's going to find it. and He's going he's to exploit that. My friend Dave Lund is a very successful real estate investor that lives in Colorado. Recently, we were together and he told me this story about how he got his best commercial deal ever. He's primarily a buy and hold investor with residential real estate properties. And up until this deal, he actually done no commercial deals ever. I was fascinated by the story and all the different steps and the things that he had to do to get this deal. He calls it a blue vase deal. I'm gonna let him tell you the rest of the story. I was reading Robert Allen's book called The Challenge. And Robert Allen is one of the original real estate gurus out there. A news reporter reaches out to him and says, are these principles real? Like, is this legitimate stuff? Or are you just making this up? He's like, no, it's real. And the reporter's like, prove it to me. He's like, okay, in your book, you say anybody can do this. You've been doing this your whole life. Can anybody really do this? And Robert's like, you're really putting me to the test. So he says, all right, put me in any unemployment line in the United States and I will take three people and give me 90 days and they will never need to step foot in an employment line again. Wow. That's a... That's a- That's a bold challenge. And he puts up a flyer in the unemployment office and he gets about, I think like 20 people into this little room. I mean, narrows it down to three people. He gives them this little pamphlet to read about the blue base story. And it's about a Vietnam vet who was discouraged because he couldn't find a job. He was trying and trying. And so he meets this oil executive and he said, he convinces him that he will do anything for a job. Okay. And so The oil exec gives him a task and he goes out and does the task. He says, okay, well you did the first task. So I want you to do a second task. And so he gives him the second task and he goes out and does it. So he hires him, gives him a small job at the company. And about four or five weeks later, there's an opportunity for another position, kind of a promotion. And so this oil executive calls the Vietnam vet on a Sunday. And he says, you know what? I was, I was out yesterday with my wife and we were somewhere in downtown on this street and there was this blue vase in the window and he calls him at like Sunday morning at 10 a.m. He says, if you can have that blue vase to me by 5 p.m., I'll give you this promotion. The oil executive knows that he told him the wrong street, (laughs) that it's Sunday and that jewelry store where the vase is sold is closed. Yep. And that it's going to be really hard. And really at the end of the day, it's just a story about undeniable creativity, persistence, and determination. So you got a $1.2 million building for under $500,000 because you chased the blue vase. <laughs> because I chased the blue vase. You're right, man. That's one heck of a blue vase, man. People always ask me, well, and they probably ask you, where do you find your leads? This was a blue vase lead. Every step along the way, you have a hurdle that you you have no clue how you're going to get over. And it doesn't matter. If you just try, you'll figure it out. I was actually on vacation back in Illinois, and I live in Colorado. And so, you know, you have a little bit of free time. And I bid at the trustee sale in Colorado. Well, the auction happens Wednesday. I want to go see who bid on what and what it got bid up to on Thursday. And so... I looked at the post sale list and there was a commercial building on the list. And usually there's not many commercial buildings, maybe 1% of all foreclosures in Colorado that make the public trustee sale are commercial. So that was weird. And then the next thing was it sold for a dollar over. Mm. And so when something sells for a dollar over, it means one of two things. Either the person that bid it for a dollar over was an idiot or they're a genius. found was that it was assessed for 750 right. the bid at the auction was 350 so i'm going why did why did it sell for only a dollar over if it's really worth 750 or more and nobody else bid on it except for one person at 350 yeah and the one person that bid on it was not a regular big bidder it was an escrow it was a 
escrow fund for a prominent lawyer in town, which was mm -hmm. even more strange. There were six liens on the property. And what I saw was that the second lien was the one that foreclosed at the auction. It slowly was beginning to go, okay, so he paid 350 at the sale, but there's the first mortgage on it. Okay. So when you buy that lien at the sale, you buy it subject to anything in front of it. Every time we go, hmm, we have to either dig in or get out. And so I'm going, hmm, because most people don't go to the trustee sale to pay retail for a property. Right. So I go, hmm, if you're 12 years into a 30-year amortized loan, that's a 500K loan, you owe roughly 400K at year 12. Okay. So if 400 was owed and he paid 350 at the sale and it's assessed for 750, it, he roughly paid what it's worth. Gotcha. Okay. So I get that's back the, into that's town. The worst case I'm, scenario, right? Yes. And you know, well, it's not the worst case because if the second foreclosed, who's to say that the first is current? Yeah, that's true. That's true. So we're back in town. It's Monday. You only have eight days after a property sells at the auction to file an intent to redeem. I don't know where to start, but I go to the lender that foreclosed from second position. And luckily, it was a local lender. So if this was Wells Fargo, I'd be dead in my tracks. Yeah. But it's a local lender. So I go into the community bank. And I happen to know them. And I stop in. I say, hey, can I have some of your time? So I talk to the guy that forecloses. He's the banker that foreclosed from second position. And he begins to fill in some of the dots. But I honestly, I'll admit, I couldn't follow everything that he was saying. But so he tells me that two guys own the property basically as of 2009. And in 2009, one of them went under. The recession hit him, but he was not a trustworthy guy. And he didn't pay his IRS payroll taxes. So within three years, he owed the IRS over a million and a half bucks. Oof. Right? Yeah. And what does the IRS do? The IRS goes and liens everything you own. And so imagine you're two guys that own this property. Imagine you're the guy that is trying to run a business, make it through the recession, and your other guy, another gentleman that owns this building with you that you didn't know about goes and doesn't pay the payroll taxes. And now the building that you own together has a million and a half bad debt behind your mortgage. Oh, that's bad. And somewhere along the way, you find this out. And so what do you do? And so somewhere around 2013, 2014, he meets up with one of the best and brightest lawyers in town and they come up with a plan. Foreclose on the second. Stop paying it intentionally. Do an intentional foreclosure. Because there were six liens total on this property, Andy. Okay. The first that we talked about for 500K from the old owner, a second for 350K, and then there was four other liens. For a $750,000 property, there was over $2 million of debt on this property. Wow. So it was completely upside down. Yeah. And to protect themselves, they the sixth lien. They filed a lien against their own property before they went into foreclosure so that they had the last chance to redeem on the property. So the foreclosing lender that I talked to gives me the rundown and he says, Dave, go after the third, buy the third, and use that to redeem and get the property. And I said, but why would I go after this property if the first is owed 500K? And he said, Dave, that's not a 30 year loan. It was a 15 year loan. Uh, so that's when you figured it out. Yeah. Not a so if you do the math on a 15 year amortization at six and a half percent interest on a 500K loan, after about 12, 12 and a half years, assuming, and so this is a big assumption that the loan's current, Right. 125 is what's owed on that loan. Uh, okay. And this is where you're blue vasing. You're just trying to go, what am I doing here? And what's next? I don't know what's next. Trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together. And you have to make some assumptions. And the yeah. assumption you make is that if you're the good guy that's foreclosing on himself to wipe off his partner's bad debt, and you're foreclosing from the second, yeah, I had to make the assumption that he was current on the first. Sure. Why would he pay $350,000 for the second if he wasn't current on the first? Yeah. Right. Tuesday's day four of eight. So on Tuesday, I call the third lien holder, the Weld Lamer Economic Development Fund. Okay. Turns out there's a president, 
and he doesn't really know anything about this. And then there's a retired banker that volunteers 20 hours a week with this organization to help them do their loans. And he's the guy I have to talk to. I leave a message for him because he's not in on Tuesday. So also at the same time, I'm starting to go through this process of what is this property really worth? I'm a landlord, so I don't really care about what I could sell for. That's important, but I want to know what it can rent for. So I call the three commercial brokers that I know, set up appointments with them. I'm saying, do you know a property manager? Do you know an insurance broker that brokers insurance for commercial properties? Do you know other industrial property owners that I could talk to? I'm just trying to cover my bases. And it's a tricky balance because at the same time, I'm trying to do this kind of on the DL, right? Because I don't want alarms to go off. And how do you value a property that you don't get to see the inside of, let alone a commercial property? And so I'm dealing with two 6,000 square foot industrial buildings, Mm -hmm. right? And so I'm calling all the tenants. So one was a lawn care company. I own rentals. I talked to him about the lawn care business. I was able to find out what he pays in rent by saying, hey, I'm looking to rent similar space in the area. What are you paying in rent? Okay. Uh-huh. There was a cabinet company in there. There was an engineer in there. I called all, everybody I could find on Google that rented at these buildings I called because I want to know, are they vacant? Are they occupied? What's going on? So you knew who they were. You called them up for different reasons, but your sole objective was to find out the information you wanted, which one, were they paying rent? Two, how much were they paying? Basically, yeah. Gotcha. I like yeah. it. So now Wednesday, day five of eight, I think I'm on to something here. I know there's equity from talking to the lender, but I don't know, I don't have a way to get to the property because to get to the property, I have to buy one of the two. So there's four junior liens, one's the IRS, one's the old owner. Yeah. It was the old owner's wife, by the way, because he can't redeem on a property that he foreclosed. Okay. But you knew what they were doing. You knew yeah. that. It was yeah. It's fishy, right? So I'm trying to buy one of the two liens. So first I called the fifth lien holder. This is a judgment on Denver. Uh, it was basically a trim provider because the company was a trim company. They were cabinet and trim. Very responsive. They've been through this before. The lien was for 80K. They were owed 100 at this point. I called the CEO. The CEO put me in touch with this one guy. He said, yep, here's how we do it. Here's what we want. We want 20K. I was like, great. So I at least have something. Yeah. So I could buy $100,000 lien for 20 and I could use that to redeem. I kept digging because the banker told me to go after the third. The third was the 500K lien. So I called back. I talked to the retired banker. He tells me, Dave, I did this loan in 2009. We wrote it off in 2012. It was a 500K loan. They owed us 625 at the time of 2012. I wrote it off. It's done. Why do you want me to dig this back up? He's basically asking me, why do you want me to do more work? And I tell him, I want to buy the lien. I want to give you money so you can make more loans. And he's going, Dave, I'm a retired banker that volunteers here. What? You're asking me to do more work. And I'm like, and I couldn't understand. He wasn't responsive. I thought this would be a no brainer, right? Hey, I'm calling your company. I want to give you money. And he's going, "Mm, no, thanks. So frustrated, really frustrated, don't know what to do. He says he'll think about it. Thursday, day six of eight, I call the the third lender, the 500K lien twice, voicemail all day, no response. I call the fifth lender, he's ready. Worst case, I can buy that lien. If you buy a $100,000 lien for 20,000, the sixth lien can come and redeem and pay you the 100,000. Yeah, which is it's a home run, right? A week's worth of work. 80 grand home run. Yes, uh-huh. they could do that. I didn't realize that though. Friday, this is day seven of eight. Yeah. I've got to have my money in by Monday. Third lender, call him back, trying to get the, trying to buy this lien. He's on the fence. He's going to talk to another banker that he used to work with. So this guy was a 25 year banker at one of the big banks in town. He's telling me, Dave, I don't think it's going to happen. You should go pursue another option. I tell him, I've got another option, but I want yours. He says, let's talk Monday. So I'm working both angles. Monday comes. First call was to lender at 8.30 a.m. in third position. I said, where are we at? Are we going to make this happen or not? And we talk for about half an hour. He sincerely didn't understand what I wanted to do. And I said, I think his name was Joe. I said, Joe, I want to buy this lien and file intent to redeem so that I can own that property. 
because they didn't pay your loan and I don't think that's right. And so I'm going to buy it out from him. So I own that property and I control it. And he's going, Dave, this seems risky. And I go, Joe, let me assume the risk. I need you to help me by selling me the lien. And he goes, Dave will sell it for 20. <laughs> nice. Go, Joe, nice. that's awesome. But I'd really like to pay you 10 for it. <laughs> and he said, hey, Dave. <laughs> you have the, you're, this I, is day eight. You've got to day eight. today. He yeah. offers 20 for a $500,000 lien, which you've been chasing for days. And you, yeah. see the, you have the, the cojones to say, I'll do 10. I said, Joe, you told me to pursue another option. I pursued another option. I've got another option at 10. So I, maybe I was at 10 with the other one. Cause I, whatever the other one was willing to sell to me, that's what I told him. I said, I've got the other 10. I'd rather own yours. Yours is better. Let's do 10. I'll meet you in two hours with a cashier's check. He said, all right, Dave, I'll get the paperwork. And I was like, right on. So we go, we meet until I don't call back the other lien holder until I get the paperwork signed from the third lender. And I call back the, the fifth junior lien holder. And I say, guys, sorry, I got another lien. We go to turn in our paperwork at the public trustee's office at 30. I wish we would have gone there earlier. If the paperwork's not in and stamped by 4.30, it's not good. We go there at 3.30. We turn in the paperwork. Public trustee's a sweet old lady, but this isn't her wheelhouse. She just does her standard stuff. She's going through the paperwork. She doesn't think our paperwork's right. We show her our paperwork's right. She doesn't understand our lien position. She wants to see the original note. All this stuff. It's four o'clock. It's four ten. It's four fifteen. She hasn't time stamped our intent to redeem yet. I'm starting to sweat. I'm starting to get nervous here. I'm like, you just need to stamp this, because what I figured out is the lawyer that was the high bid the sale. His office is on the sixth floor of that building, and I knew he was going to be watching it. So four twenty comes. We're still not done. Four twenty five. She finally accepts our paperwork, stamps it. Wow. 430 because we're still there hanging out the elevator opens and I look out and it's mr. It's the big bad lawyer and it's kind of dead silent in the public trustee's office I mean, you know end of the day 430 he walks up comes to the desk and I'm a little intimidated by him I'll be honest and he gets up there and he looks around and he sees me and he looks back at the public trustee And he looks back at me and he says what are you doing here? and I kind of take a moment and I say, what are you doing here? And he says, well, I'm here to, I'm here to request the deed for link lane. And I think that's when it dawned on him because he's a smart enough guy to know what he didn't cover and what he did cover. And he looks at me and he says, did you file an intent to redeem? And I said, I did file an intent to redeem. And he said, did you file an intent to redeem on 309 link lane? I said, I did. And then he got quiet and he looks at the public trustee and he says, can I have a copy of all the documents that they just turned into you? And she gives him a copy and he says, Dave, would you like to join me up in my office for a minute? And I didn't want to, but I said, okay, and we go up there. And he doesn't say a word for at least five minutes while he's looking over the documents. And finally he talks. And that's when I knew that we were in the, we were in the right because he basically said, what are you guys trying to do with this property? And that's when my partner, Mike said, Tim, why did you go buy the third? And, uh, and we just went from there. Gotcha. Wow. So two year process that he was helping to orchestrate. Yeah. Their plan was to foreclose from the second and have all the bad debt behind the second fall off the property. And his plan was to show up at the auction, bid on the property and get his property and wipe off all the bad debt and get rid of his old partner. Uh, we didn't go anywhere with the negotiations that day, but he knew that we beat him at their two-year game. He left two loopholes. Only one really mattered. If we bought the 80K lien, it would have paid us off. But we bought the lien that was worth 625 for 10K. And so the only way for him to get us out of the way is to pay off that lien in full. And there wasn't enough equity to pay off that lien in full. Wow. So fast forward turns out the property's worth closer to 1.1, 1.2 million. 
um, it was fully occupied and because the tenant was original owner tenant. It was in great shape. The other fun part that we didn't talk about is that we paid 10 K for that lien. We got a private lender to fully fund the redemption of 350 K. And then that same lender went and paid off the first for 125 K. So that she just had one note with us for 475. Wow. We had 10 K out of the pocket, 475 in rents from day one and a building that's fully leased and worth about 1.2 million now. And uh, we'll go to the bank after it's been another three or four months and we'll get that private lender refinanced out and we'll either have the option of doing a cash out or just a straight up rate and term refi. Wow. What were the gross rents? Gross rents today are for the front building. They're about 6,000 in the back building, about 5,000 and our debt payment with the private lender currently is about 4,500. Okay. So it's about a six to $7,000 net net. Wow. Rental. Wow. So you got a $1.2 million building for under $500,000 because you chased the blue vase. <laughs> because I chased the blue vase. You're right, man. That's one heck of a blue vase, man. You can't sell the property. So, you know, right? the story's too good. We've got a few of those where the story's good enough that like our, you know, our, we, I still remember our very first property we bought. I remember telling people that the old owners were unique.